approved in 2019 uh, to promote the well-being of the citizens of Rio Blanco County with respect and dedication to our unique way of life by protecting the overall health of our community. So that is the mission statement that still stands. Um, is there any um, anything that we need to do or suggestions from the board to change or amend that at all at this point? Okay, great. All right, so first item on the agenda is just a, a COVID-19 update. Um, there is a lot to talk about surrounding vaccination, and I do understand that, so I did break it out a little bit. So if you can all bear with me, I would like to give a quick case update, have a discussion about that, and then give our hospitals a chance to also give us an update from a healthcare perspective before we move into vaccine specifics. I think that would be Hello. a good way to All right, to meeting started. Proceed. Um, so I'll go ahead. Oh, Excuse me, Alice. That's okay. Can you folks on the phone please mute your phone unless you have a question? Thank you. Um, all right, so I'll start with just the COVID-19 update, and then again, we'll go into vaccinations, uh, and then finally other public health business. There's lots to talk about. So um, as you can see here, um, or actually, I'm sorry, I don't have it pulled up. I'm gonna quickly pull up, um, your report card should be in front of you. That's our weekly email that goes out. I put together weekly case data and send that to members in the community. Mm -hmm. right. The message there a second ago, it's not now that, yeah, that some people have Oh, that wanted to be admitted. Oh, I see, okay, on the, oh, it looks like they're automatically admitted if I don't click after a second, so we should be. They were having trouble hearing. You know what, um, if you're on Google Meet, you will have to oh, call there, in to hear the audio. Sorry second, if you joined late, it is 878-9432. Okay. You know what, um, if Thank you're you. on Google Meet, you will have to call in to hear the audio. Sorry if you joined late, it is 878-9432. Thank you. That might be why they're just confused because they can't hear it through the Google Meet. Um, yeah, oh, she said I did call. Uh, her, maybe hang up and dial back in. Okay. Uh, maybe hang up and dial back in. Okay. Is there someone on the phone that could confirm that they can hear me, though, just to make sure I'm. I'm on the phone and I can hear, yes. Okay. All right. So we'll keep going. Um, so I have put the report card in front of you, and Diane, I hope, I think I, I should have added that, added you to that list a, a while ago. Um, it's a weekly email that I send out that just summarizes case data. Um, but you have, great. So this here is our county website, uh, COVID-19 page. So a lot of the data that I pull from, to, to put on those report cards comes from this is our public facing dashboard. So as you can see here, uh, we have case trends. We also have places where you can look at the current case counts, uh, vaccination uh, numbers, and this is all specific to our county. So just remind everyone that's there and it is live. It's updated every couple of days. Um, here, I just wanted to point out in terms of overall case trends and updates, as you can see, we've just been experiencing, continuing to see uh, just a sustained increase in cases and case rates. Um, this last, um, the way this dashboard is set up, it's a, it, because it's live, uh, this last bar is just from the beginning, it's from this week. Uh, so you really have to kind of ignore that very first one to look at the, the trends in the past. So as you can see, it's a, it's, it's a pretty steep incline here in case rates. Um, we are currently looking at about a 10% hospitalization rate of all reported cases. Um, that's over the past three months, uh, looking since June 20th. Uh, 24 out of our 200 out of 228 cases have been uh, required hospitalization, and that does mean an at least an, an overnight stay in the hospital. That doesn't include emergency room visits. Um, we have had a total of breaks since March. Uh, well, a oh, oh, total. If you can mute if you're on the phone, please. Thank you. Uh, we had a total of 35 breaks. These are cases in individuals who are fully vaccinated definition of a, of a breakthrough case. You said since March. Is that March of this year? Or last year? <laughs> yeah, I shouldn't have said March because it's relevant because that's total vaccine breakthrough cases the last 18 or of so. all the cases, but we've only had the vaccine available that's since mid-March. That's why I said that. Um, so uh, that, that accounts for about 10% of our total cases since vaccines are widely available in March. So that's, that's a little more useful piece of information. Uh, we are continuing to test um, community members every day at public health, and we're definitely seeing a sharp increase in that testing demand. 
partly, as, of course, as a result of the increasing cases, but also uh, more demand for additional surveillance testing um, and travel. So there's lots of reasons why we're performing tests uh, countywide. So I won't continue. Um, I'll actually just stop there and, and take any questions about the dashboard um, before I jump into our, our new dashboard that we've created that has a little more information about uh, people's health and the health impacts of COVID uh, in our community. Do we have any questions on what we've covered so far, Jeff? Just on, on uh, Alice, thank you so much for this information. Uh, the term vaccine breakthrough uh, is a little um, troubling because it sounds like a vaccine failure. It sounds like these people received the vaccine, it, not only did it not protect them, but we're seeing that currently 10% of all people getting this now have been vaccinated. How do we know that the vaccine itself is not the Delta variant? Uh, well, the the term breakthrough, I'll just say that is the generally accepted term worldwide. So I didn't come up with that that name, but I I can see uh, what you're saying. It, it, but it does refer to cases where someone has received uh, full vaccination status, however, have then contracted COVID. And I do go into that in quite a lot of detail in the next section about vaccines. But is what they're getting the same as what the other people? Is it COVID? Is it same no. thing? Same thing? Or is it a different thing that they're coming down with after the vaccine? No, it's the same virus. Uh, the dominant strain here in our community is the Delta variant. Um, so it's uh, it's not caused by the vaccine, but it is the same virus that's in the community that everyone else gets. Um, Verified by the PCR testing. Right. Yep. It just means it's. It, they've been infected even though they're vaccinated, is what that means. Uh, quickly, when I was on a call here a month or so ago with the governor, um, his narrative at the time was that being vaccinated would, you make, it may, you may have a breakthrough case, but the odds of ending up in the hospital were significantly less. Is that the case here? Do you have any data on, of these 35, have any of them ended up as an overnight stay, I assume, in the hospital. Yes, and I actually have that very detailed in the next slide. Okay. So in the vaccination section, I've got a lot, and I can show that. No, no, it's okay. But we're seeing it a little different than what they were thinking a month ago. No, no, it's actually right in line with what the state and the nationwide data and statistics are here locally. And I can show you, it's a good opportunity to jump into the new dashboard because that's part of that. Do we have any other questions on this so far? Uh, I see Carly raising her hand in the back of I'm going to have to have you come up so we can hear you. I'm getting a lot of static here. I know. And I think, yeah, I, I don't know if anyone's not muted, but just another reminder in case you're not muted. Um, yeah. There is talk around town that I have heard from people that our hospitals are at capacity. And I don't know if you can address that or if one of the hospitals is online. So the, yes, and that is actually the next item on okay. the agenda. So I've got hospital update, and actually both of our hospitals, um, I would, I'm going to invite them to give an update. So that's a perfect uh, question since they're here. So let me show the new dashboard um, because it's still relating to case data. Get that out of the way, and then we can actually just go ahead and open it up to our hospitals, if that's okay with everybody. Yep. And then address vaccinations in the next uh, section here. So. Uh, this is something we've been working on. I've been promising you for quite some time. Uh, this is our new dashboard, and I just need to explain where it comes from, where this information comes from, and hopefully, looks like the... Oh, okay. So we got a little technical pause here. I have it, yeah, I have it shared on my screen here, so I'm hoping that that... No, that shouldn't matter. Um, ...goes up there. Um, while she's doing that, the, the only other item, and just for the benefit of people who are on the phone and can't see the slides, um, so I, I, I think it's also important to note um, all of the oh, data that I have. This is all of whether it's test positivity or breakthrough cases or hospitalization. This is all of
unmuted you. Press star 6 to unmute. Uh, and a perfect example of why our data is the most accurate source of local level COVID data is in, with our with our deaths. Um, so we we currently have six six deaths as a result of COVID-19 in our um, on the state website. It is listed as eight. Um, I investigate each and every one, uh, verify with medical providers that COVID-19 was in fact the cause of death. Um, so there were two that were it was not confirmed that that was. And so our number there is more accurate than what you'll find on that website. Uh, same with the vaccination data. So I pull everything from, I pull everything. So it looks like it's stopped working and I'm not really sure why, because it's got me as presenting, but it's not showing my screen. So let me double check what I'm doing wrong here. Because I'm presenting on here and it's not showing up there. I'm going to turn it around so you guys can see it on my laptop. Does that work? <laughs> I don't know what else to do. Um, hopefully the people on the phone or on the Google Meet can see it. That is okay. I can just show them this way. So it's not going to be a great view for all of you. I'll just quickly go over what it involves. Um, this will be published onto our website soon, so you'll be able to go in and actually play with it and look at it yourself. Um, but essentially, we do a case investigation Google form for every case that we have in Rio Blanco County. So when we pick up the phone to call someone after they've tested positive, we uh, our case investigators ask a list of questions, and it goes into an electronic form. And we've been doing that since late March or early April of this year. Uh, so that then goes into all those responses go into a spreadsheet, which I have pulled all of this from. So this information, this data is simply pulling from that source of all the case investigations we perform. So I will let you all um, explore that on your own. I really wanted to be able to show you but, um, and show people, uh, and that looks like I'm not necessarily sharing it on my screen, so it's unfortunate. Um, but it will give you the opportunity to break down uh, the case data, and that includes the, for example, uh, symptoms people experienced, whether or not they were hospitalized, whether or not they had pneumonia, whether or not they went to the ER during their illness, course of their illness. Um, it asks a lot of those questions, uh, whether or not they were vaccinated or not. Um, so it will allow you, as the public, to be able to go in and essentially filter all of those things and see the actual numbers and percentages of those responses that people give. So it's a little more than just a case count uh, and a hospitalization count, which is all our current dashboard displays. This will be um, a little more um, detailed clinical health information that we can see. And so I was going to show you what's significant. For example, I did use uh, take one of these tables and put it on your report card. Um, so I'll at least try to pull that up and we'll see if that will, will show. Um, let me see if, because that's presenting. So let me try it this way. Um, let me just go to that report card and I can show you an example of what one of the tables looks like because I put it on the report card this week. Again, I do apologize for not being able to show you all live. So if you look here at the bottom page, this is where I pulled, uh, I pulled this table right here from the new, from the new dashboard. Um, it would be really great if I could at least zoom in, but we are not having a good technology day, are we? At all. <laughs> I don't know how to zoom in. Um, so if you can't see it, it says symptoms, and this would be a list of all the symptoms of COVID-19, shortness of breath, sore throat, body aches, chills, et cetera. Um, and then it breaks it down, the people who had a response of unknown, meaning these are people that we don't know the answer to from this because we didn't have the Google form at that time. But if you look over unvaccinated versus vaccinated, you can see that those symptoms, uh, the numbers of people experiencing those symptoms are much lower if they, you filter it by people who've had their vaccine. So it's just an example of where we can look and say, all right, we understand that na nationally they're telling us and on the state level they're telling us people with the COVID vaccine don't experience the severe symptoms. This is a way we can actually go in and look at it locally. The people here in Rio Blanco County living here who have had COVID-19 and responded to these questions we can actually verify that for ourselves. So that's the purpose of this new dashboard, so we can see more the impact of COVID-19.
COVID on our on our citizens. So I will stop there completely. Um, and before I hand it over to the hospitals, though, to give an update, I'd like any questions that you, the board, might have. I don't have a question, but so it seems like the new dashboard is going to be more transparent. Then it seems like is that an accurate statement. Uh, well, more detailed. I mean, it, yeah, there's nothing not transparent about the other well, one. No, no, <laughs> but yeah, I know what yeah, you mean. Yeah, it'll be more detailed. So people, exactly though, you, you've hit the nail on the head. So if anybody had question as to where's Alice get these percentages from? Is yeah. she just pulling it out of thin air? And I've zoomed in now so you can see, you know, it's like, well, no, these are actual numbers drawn from that. So yes, that is correct. If there's not any other questions from anybody, I can open it up to our hospital. But question. Uh -oh. Hey, Alice. Uh, yes. It's Jolene. Um, so, which of the vaccines are you seeing the breakthroughs in the most? Would you, um, you know, and are you guys considering Johnson and Johnson vaccine breakthroughs as actual breakthroughs since they didn't, you know, say that they would prevent it? They just said you wouldn't be hospitalized or, you know, in the ICU. But which are you counting all three in the count, or do you know which one is the strongest of the vaccines? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, it's locally that's a tough question because most people here got Moderna or Pfizer. We didn't have a big of big percentage of people that got the Johnson and Johnson. We, um, but yes, in the definition of a vaccine breakthrough case worldwide is full vaccination with either two doses of an mRNA vaccine, which is Moderna or Pfizer, and one of Johnson. That was just the prescribed <laughs> dosing. Um, so, so in answer to your question, yes, that is included. Uh, but locally, I'm not necessarily able to say one way or the other because I wouldn't. It wouldn't be an accurate statement if I said most of the breakthroughs are one or the other because we um, didn't see a lot of that um, percentage-wise here. If that makes sense, mostly Moderna is what people received here. I hope that answered your question. And Gary, did you have another question? Also, <laughs> sorry, I'm trying to. I'm just trying to fully understand this chart. Um, the, the unknown category obviously has significantly more people in that category. Um, I'm assuming, and I, I just want to make sure I'm right, that, that you're talking one person may have multiple symptoms here. So do you know yes. how many people the total here um, so it would, these categories? Yes, yeah, so it would be, and, and when you see the dashboard, gosh, it would make so much more sense if I could show it to you. Um, there's a filter and it will say, okay, you can select age group here, you'd select whatever you wanna see. So this is all simply out of the responses received from these, um, from this survey on the to with the total cases of what we have here in New York County. So we're at 875 cases. Out of those cases, the unknowns are that portion of people that we don't, we didn't do, we weren't using that Google form, so we don't have a response or people didn't want to disclose that information. That's also completely fine too. So the unknown, um, that's why I wanted those numbers to stay there though. They asked me because I, it could be misleading if we didn't have the unknowns in there, right? Because then you could look at it and say, well, two versus 14, that doesn't necessarily tell you much because there's a lot of people we don't know the answer to. But from now on moving forward, basically any case from April on using this form, we're gonna have a, be able to see what's happening in real time. So I could take the cases, filter it for like the cases in the last two weeks. You know, how many of those people are answered yes to this, no to this. So I hope that at least explains it. This table on its own doesn't give you a ton of information, but the numbers are, are real. And the main point of this table is really, tell me if I'm wrong, to show the difference between the unvaccinated and the vaccinated as far as the number of symptoms. Yes. This particular table, and that was because I chose, you know, symptoms and then filter it through people vaccinated versus unvaccinated. But on the table or on the workbook yourself, you could go in and you could look at all the anything you'd like to, if that makes sense. Yeah. One other thing that may be confusing that statistic it says uh, that the CDC doesn't consider a person vaccinated until two weeks after the injection. Therefore, everyone who dies or has a reaction within the first two weeks after being injected is not considered a vaccine death. They remain in the unvaccinated column, which may account for some of these 
altered statistics and signs that we're seeing. I don't know what, maybe you can explain why they don't, why yeah. they do that. I, I can, um, because we do have that data, Jeffrey, we have it. Um, there have been, I actually on another slide here, um, I'm going to move forward because I'll move back because I'd like our hospital to have a chance. Um, so if you look here on this slide, out of 380 million doses of COVID vaccine that's been given in the United States um, from December 14, 2020 through today or through the 13th of September, uh, there's been two confirmed cases of blood clots, 46 confirmed after the J&J, &J, two, two after mRNA. There's been 854 total reports of myocarditis. Uh, there's been zero deaths that they have linked to the vaccine. So this is all from VAERS. This is every person who's vaccinated in America. Um, they are being monitored. So that data isn't hidden. Um, so what I think you're asking, though, your question is, as far as my table is concerned, these are, these are people who are alive and well and live here and have COVID-19. You know, they're positive on a test, so they're a case, they get a call, and we ask the questions. So it's not, I think you're talking about two separate things <laughs> it with data, but that's just, again, that's just my okay, thank you. small brain trying to explain the, the, the data is hard to, to be able to communicate with people. Um, context is very important, though, because you, you're right, things can be very misleading if you don't show all the context. So that's the whole effort I'm making with this new dashboard is so that we have all that context uh, for people, and there's nothing that is hidden. For the sake of time, why don't we move on to the hospital? Yes, let's do that. I've got uh, Rangeley District Hospital and Pioneers Medical Center. If we want to start with Rangeley District Hospital, I don't know if Kyle or anyone from RDH is on. If you would like to just uh, give a, an update from your standpoint as far as how you're doing, what your perceptions are, uh, really anything. The table is it's, capacity, yeah. oh, capacity, yes, um, very important. Uh, the floor is yours. RDH, do we have anybody? If, if you're speaking, we can't hear you. Um, is there someone from RDH? Um, if I tell you what, if you are, we can't hear you. So why don't we move on to Pioneers? I saw Liz on there um, or whoever you have designated to do this. Why don't we do that? And then we'll check back with RDH when you're done. Can you hear me? This is Kristen. Yes. Okay. So currently we have one patient hospitalized with COVID. Um, otherwise, we are open. So we have had some recent positive employees. Four out of the six were fully vaccinated when they came back with a positive test. So I just thought that was interesting. Um, what else? So any other questions, Alice? Uh, yeah, just if you could speak to capacity, are you um, how, just that you're, how are you doing? Are you guys doing okay with bed availability for people in the community? Anything you want? Yeah, we are good on bed availability. Um, we're doing well with the ER. Our staffing's okay at this point. Transfer out to heart. What's that? Transfer out to heart. Yeah, it's still difficult to transfer patients out to surrounding hospitals. Is, can I ask? Uh, this commission Moyer, is that because they're at capacity or is there another reason? Are they understaffed or what's going on? There's a lot of... Well, there's a lot of things that are going on in the different facilities. Um, last week we had a trauma that we had to transfer out and we had to call 33 different facilities around the United States. And a lot of them are not accepting patients out of Colorado, number one. Grand Junction had a large influx of patients. They also have some staffing-related issues. So it's a combination, I believe. Okay. Thank you. Are, Thank you. Um, are we ready to see if RDH is yeah. on there? Hey, yes. Anybody I'm, from RDH? You know, I've just got one kind of lingering question. It just sure. came to me. If we're using hospital beds as the driving statistic for whether we put in restrictions or not, even what color they are, why when we were finding ourselves with a possible situation where our hospital bed capacity was challenged, why was the first response to shut people's businesses down instead of looking at getting more hospital beds? 
you might have to ask the governor that question. Like I to, didn't shut anything really down, like so I don't know. Uh, but no, I think rhetorical. No, it's not rhetorical. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I'm sorry. No, I just thought it was. No, that's okay. And I. and I think that's a great answer. I mean, but it's yes. I mean, it, there's lots of things that, of course, go into that. Uh, but I don't think we necessarily need to go into it now. But and, and I would note in Rublenko County, as you're aware, we uh, did not follow those I'm governors. Aware of that direction. So we should have more. I'm aware. Of that. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, RDH. If there's anybody on from Rangeley District yeah. Hospital, I want to give you a chance to also give an update. And that's okay if there's not. People are busy. <laughs> Do you know their situation in there? Yeah, I can give a quick update. Um, I've been attending their ICS meetings every other week. Um, RDH is doing a fantastic job mitigating just like Pioneers is. Um, you know, they're dealing with cases, you know, inside and outside of the hospital. They're caring for patients. Um, I, I never really can speak to capacity because I'm not there at the moment at the time, but I believe it's similar from what it sounds like uh, with what Kristen said, transferring patients out is tough. And that isn't a large part due to COVID. I mean, we have high record number of hospitalized people with COVID currently in the country uh, and statewide, but we also are worried as a hospital, uh, the hospitals I know, I don't want to speak for, for them. Maybe Kristen, you're welcome to jump in on this if you'd like to, but one thing that we are very wa watching very closely is um, coming into flu season. We're worried flu might make a big comeback this year. We've also already seen a high end number of RSV cases in kids, so we're worried about pediatric ICU bed availability nationwide, so. I'm gonna ask the question that I think is the giant elephant in the room, and that is, because I, I heard it on the street this morning, of staff, even right here at Pioneers, that are saying they're gonna leave if they are forced by a mandate to be vaccinated. And uh, Kristen, is that right, with Kristen. Pioneers? Uh, Kristen, yes. Kristen. Can you speak to that at all? And I don't mean to put you on the spot. That That's all right. This, this is Liz, and so okay. I can speak okay. to that. We Thank did you. a survey monkey when the mandate came down from CDPHE. When we did the survey monkey, there was about 46% of our employees that would not remain at Pioneers if the vaccine was mandated. CDPHE has provided two waivers, a medical waiver and a religious waiver. So for right now, Pioneers is following exactly what the CDPHE is mandating, um, and that's all we have to go on currently. So October 21st, we'll know more. We have only lost three employees um, who have chosen to leave the facility because of the mandate. We've worked with them spent time talking with them about the alternatives, um, but this is still their personal choice. But there, there is religious and medical waivers to that? Currently because there is. Um, the CDPHE has determined what that medical waiver guidance is, and I'd be happy to share those with you. I could email that to one of the um, commissioners and you can share okay. that. The license. Unless, Alice, do you have that? I do, actually. I can, yes. I can, uh, and I could forward that along. Okay, perfect. Anyway, thank, thank you, Liz. Uh, thank you for doing that, Liz. That's, I was not aware there were potential waivers available. That's good to hear. Yeah, yeah you can certainly look at what the CDPHE provides, and we um, allowed for a little bit of loose um, wording in our religious variants, if you will. I can forward that. Okay, okay thank you. Well, good to know. Because um, So I'm hearing that is a concern as far as potentially a concern mm -hmm. regarding staffing uh, in the future. Is that a oh, fair assumption? Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Uh, it, Jeff, it, it, yeah. just, it just seems really that we're putting people in a very, very difficult position. They're having to choose between their freedom and their yeah. employment, or yeah. their freedom of put, be able to put food on the table. This gets really complicated yeah. quickly here. And that really is whether, which is more important, health or the Constitution and freedom. Personally, if I lose my health, 
I've got remedies for that. If I lose my freedom, I don't have remedies for that. Well, thank you. That's thank you for sharing that point. I I think that's valid. One of the concerns we're dealing with here. Um, do we have Alice? Are you ready to? I'm not hearing anybody from Rangeley. No, and if they get if they come on anytime, yeah, Scott does and jump in. Are we ready to move on? Sure, and it's all very much related. So the next slide um, is about vaccine. So um, already covered. Excuse me, whoever's not muted, can you please mute because it's making it very hard for us to hear here in the commissioner meeting room. Thank you. All right. Um, so just some quick stats. Um, and then we, we already kind of touched on the breakthroughs. So that information's in here too. Uh, we're currently at about 43%, and that's individuals that have received at least one dose here in Via Blanco County. Um, we are on our local level dashboard. Again, you can see our local data on the effectiveness of the vaccine. So uh, like I said, we've had 35 total breakthrough cases. They've all had milder symptoms than people who have not been vaccinated. And that's one of the take home points with um, as far as the information I can provide, uh, I think it's really important to delineate, you know, vaccine safety information from, uh, you know, a lot of the, the discussions about mandates. Those are important discussions to have, and I think it's easy to uh, kind of get those two mixed together. So I can only speak from just the information standpoint, and that is that locally we've had 35 breakthrough cases. They have had milder symptoms. Only two of those were hospitalized. One was actually Again, after investigation, I like to look into the numbers to make sure I'm not just reporting numbers that I don't have. There's not quality behind them. Um, one of that, one of those people was hospitalized uh, due to just having multiple, multiple comorbidities, and it was an out of abundance of caution to observe that individual is why they admitted him to the hospital, and they ended up not getting that ill, thank goodness, and made full recovery. Um, the other, though, uh, we did just recently have another a fully vaccinated individual who was hospitalized for COVID. So we're tracking it very closely, and as you can see, of course, then that's that's a, a much smaller number than what we're seeing um, total. So that's two out of the 68 hospitalized people we've had were vaccinated. So it's important to just perspective wise, understand that the vaccine is protecting people. Um, it's never going to be 100% effective, nor did we expect it to be 100% effective, especially now with the mutations of variants. Um, there is a booster recommendation that's come out, and we will be offering that at Rio Blanca County Public Health as soon as we're allowed to, to we already are, to anyone who qualifies, um, and that's in an effort to boost that immune response. It still remains the safest way uh, to prevent yourself from getting ill and dying and hospitalized from COVID-19. Um, so that those are the, the statistics I have, but I also want to open it up to any other questions you might have about uh, booster doses um, are what we're doing at Rio Blanco County for for, for our vaccine rollout, and and then get take feedback of anything we could do to do, def do differently. Hey, Alice. Um, yes. Um. So I have a question. Do you anticipate? I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Can you announce who you are? I'm sorry. I'm Jolene Dolan. I'm the school nurse over here at Meeker. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Um, do you anticipate the FDA approving for the Pfizer for like the five to eleven year old kiddos soon? And like, what yeah. time frame do you expect that to be in? Yeah, and that's that's the one question that we I try to keep track with the booster doses. We were expecting it to be late September. They've been saying mid October for a while now for the child's authorization. But well, I mean, I I just never know for sure. Um, that's one that it's rapidly occurring. So they're doing all analyzing all the trial data currently, and it's all looking great as far as safety in kids. So um, we're expecting mid-October, but I don't have a confirmation on that yet, unfortunately. Okay, did that answer the question? Kai, go ahead. Are, are the boosters rolling out in the different tiers like the vaccine did? Is that why you said if you qualify? Yes. And, and there's multiple, it's a little more though this time than just about availability. The first tier rollout was based or structured around need and getting the people that needed it first. This time they're being extra cautious because now we've had, you know, 380 million people, um, you know, being vaccinated uh, or more than that. I'm sorry, it's 380 million of the mRNA and 14.5 million with J&J. &J. So the total number 
um, you know, worldwide or close to 400 million. Uh, no, that's the United States. Um, you know, you're looking at 400 million people now. You know, they're they're analyzing all the data really carefully and making sure they know, okay, how effective is this going to end up being? What is the long-term plan? They're watching the variants like Delta, uh, the Mu variant, these various new variants, various new variants that are coming out and saying, okay, is it going to make sense to give everybody another dose? That's part of the discussion being had now, more so than just we need to roll it out to the people who need it first. But yes, it will look the same for that same reason. Uh, because the antibody level is dropping off, of course, the people with lowered immune systems, that's why we're giving that to them now, because they are seeing that big drop. Um, but then the higher risk folks and healthcare workers will be that next group um, that we want to make sure is protected. And then we'll see what happens with it. It'll likely be general public soon-ish, but they're, they're being extra careful. The idea of a booster shot, <clears throat> does that imply that the immunity wanes after a period and needs to be refortified. Yes, it, the antibody levels okay. drop off so over time. That, that truly that rate of degradation of immunity over time is known, and so they know exactly when the time the booster shots, when the patient needs them, or are these just being rolled out with the assumption that they're needed? Because at what point are they needed? When the person's immunity is dropped to 50%, 33%? So there's a whole lot of research that needs to be done if, that, if the booster shots are needed. How do we know they're needed? When are they needed? And a, a booster shot, to me, again, composed to natural immunity, you get measles once, no boosters needed. Chicken pox, no booster. You get it naturally, your body always remembers what it experienced. The vaccine injection seems to be different in that vaccine boosters are required. I'm questioning whether or not this is really indicating vaccine failure. Those are all That's really important question again. No, no, it's not actually. And I'd like to address a couple of things you said. So that research is being done, and you're you're absolutely right. There's a lot of research. So what they found is after the first it is it is, and that's what I was just saying, is they're waiting on all this data before they, you know, make these broad sweeping recommendations. So for example, the studies that we've seen now, now that it's been nine months since we've rolled this out, after about they watched and studied six months is when they started to see the decrease. Um, with Delta, they saw the decrease in effectiveness and they're tracking. So I can give you the exact numbers of the millions of people they're tracking and the, how that research is being done. So that is being done. That's a great question though, because it is important. But one last thing, as far as natural immunity goes, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, there is some protection that is provided by natural immunity. The big question is, uh, number one, first of all, obviously getting a vaccine that's safe is a much better way to get immunity than actually getting COVID and playing, getting the risk of getting sick. So you wouldn't want you to get data sick. That verifies that as yet. Potentially we get. We don't have that data in yet, and you know we don't have that data. Oh, oh we, we, well, no, you're right. I'm not saying we have data that doesn't exist yet, but I am saying that we have breakthrough case or breakthrough. We have reinfections from people who have had COVID in the past. But the main thing is, regardless of whether or not we decide that natural immunity is better than a vaccine. Okay, great. If it does, that's fantastic. The studies that they're finding is the people who have natural infection actually um, and one dose of vaccine have the most protection. So there, there's lots of data out there, but the most important take home point is we want to give people an option to have immunity without playing Russian roulette with a virus that could kill you or do permanent lung and tissue damage. People are suffering with COVID-19 infection worldwide. So we definitely don't want to push the message, you should go out there and, you know, get someone to cough on you and get sick. You know, that's, that would be the worst case scenario. So you're right, natural immunity does exist and it's something we're studying closely and we continue to study worldwide and we will continue to study for decades to come, I'm sure. But the vaccine gives you an option of getting protected safely. If there is something out there and it's going to be encountered by an individual they're going to have four ways of encountering that. It's going to fall on their skin, they're going to inhale it, or they're going to swallow it, or it's going to be injected into them with a hypodermic needle. Which of the four would you choose? Having it, having a, it's skin. not a virus, it's a vaccine, and I have had whatever that infected. Agent, whatever <laughs> disease agent challenges the human being, it's going to enter the body through one of those four routes. I'm saying that pick one much less dangerous 
to get a vaccine. It, in fact, it's, there's virtually no data on negative effects on the vaccine on the body. I've got it right here. So we have nothing but increasing childhood disease rates with increasing exposures to vaccinations. They're linear. They're one over the other. That's what I'm questioning. Is this a proper risk versus benefit response to a population with a 99.98% recovery rate? That you said no vaccines 100%. Nature is 99.98 by herself with no treatment whatsoever. That's remarkable. And yet we mask up the That's kids. That's not true. And now we threaten the 5 to 11-year-olds with a new vaccine, which the evidence does not support its administration. Well, that, kids okay. Right. Guys, I think what this shows is there is a lot of different uh, perspectives on this, and I think they're all important. So They are. We appreciate you sharing that perspective, Jeff. And with that, could, let's move on if we can. Thank you. Yes, thank you. And uh, I'll just jump on here, move move along. So um, honestly, that is all I had as far as COVID. Um, so we can we can move on. If, but I want to, of course, give anyone an opportunity to ask questions or move into any discussion, that, anything I didn't cover. Um, anyone on the phone at this point with questions on what we've covered? Alice, this is Colleen Zufelt, the school nurse on the Rangeley side. You talked briefly about, you know, we're coming into the flu season. Um, what do I need to do as far as educating parents and, you know, with regard to getting the flu vaccine and how close, if they've already gotten their COVID vaccine, I mean, do we have anything to give them some ideas about how soon they could have one versus the other? And do we have any vaccine in the county yet um, to give? Uh, yes, uh, yes and yes. So it, they have the a ACIP, that's the American Council on Immunization Practices, uh, FDA, CDC, actually um, says it is safe to co-administer those two vaccines on the same day even. You can put them in the same arm. So uh, they don't have to wait. Some doctors would recommend waiting a like two weeks is kind of the, I've heard that a lot from doctors. That's just a general recommendation on if somebody wants to separate vaccines out just to make sure you don't end up with a, you know, feeling like, really feeling like crap the next day, <laughs> then you can split it two weeks apart, but you don't have to. Uh, number two, um, yes, we have lots of flu vaccine already. So we start our first drive through next week. We'll have uh, Mondays in uh, Meeker and Thursdays in Rangeley. Uh, we're currently taking walk-ins uh, for flu shots. So. Okay. Any other questions on the phone before we move on? I do have just a quick question for you, Alice. Um, so first of all, I want to say that this is extremely challenging for all of us, and I thank you for presenting the information that you're handed. I mean, you don't you don't have a choice of a lot of the information that's being presented. It comes from a higher level, so we acknowledge that. I was on an earlier call with the North Northwest region. They had a concern that the Moderna might be out several weeks. Do you have any information on that? Uh, you mean the booster recommendation? Correct. Yes. Um, so it's it's a little it, it's complicated and it's tricky, it's ever evolving. And then of course we have mixed messages coming from various places, federal, state, uh, scientific community. That we, I, we try to keep everything in line, and it's tough. Um, so Moderna, um, the Moderna and Pfizer. So Moderna will receive an emerg the emergency use authorization for the booster. Whereas Pfizer, since it's been FDA approved, that's the one that has been officially uh, rolled out. There's two sets of studies with Pfizer and Moderna based on effectiveness. Of course, that is what's affecting the booster discussion is effectiveness. Um, so yes, the Moderna is a little delayed. However, I did ask that specific question last week. I said, well, here in this county, most people got Moderna. So I really need to know what that means. And they said the booster recommendation would be um, authorized via the EUA for Moderna alongside Pfizer, which is good. So, so that's what I know. I hope that answers your question. That's what you were referring to. Yes, that did. Thank you. I think that was Liz, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, it was. That, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, that was Liz Sellers with Pioneers for all those on the phone. Um, any other questions? I, I got Carly in the back of the room again. I'm going to make her. No question, comment, actually. Um, so I am part of the Sheepdog Board. 
Um, she's Dr. Charles Board, and we had Alice out with some presence at our event for three days, I believe. I've missed part of it. Um, but her presence was greatly appreciated by all of our, most of our visitors and people who are here. So we really appreciate her being there and helping um, welcome foreign travelers as well and safely. So there's more of a comment. Oh, thank, thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much, Carly. It was a pleasure to, to be there. Um, this is Kristen with PMC. Um, Alice, I do have a question for you regarding the studies on reinfection rates. Is there any sign that they're going to actually allow a previous COVID infection if it is documented with a positive laboratory test to stand as some form of immunity and help decrease the number of shots needed? That is, a, that is an excellent question, and we're all asking that question. <laughs> um, so it looks like, and actually we, we requested, uh, when I say we, usually it's the local public health agencies on our meetings with CDPHE, we requested last week um, more data on, you know, natural, the reinfection hospitalization rates so we can compare those to the vaccination rates, et cetera. So we're asking for that info. It looks like worldwide, um, you know, the discussions being had, there's a lot of talk as to why, you know, that's not being taken into consideration with the mandates. Um, and I think when we didn't have mandates, it was a little simpler because it was a question you could ask your doctor, you could have a conversation, that's what we tell people, have this conversation with your medical provider. You know, there's a lot of things that go along to it, like how much protection do you have? We can see that it, severity of disease plays a role in that. Uh, the presence of variants plays a role in that. So that's why there's not an easy answer to that question. However, um, when it comes to a mandate, that begs the question then, why is that not being looked at a little closer? So I wish I had a better answer for you, but I will make sure to pass that along and keep asking and get that info out to you guys. Okay, thank you so much. All right. All right, are we ready to move on? Yeah. We are. Um, oh gosh, one one last thing, sorry. This is more of a something, a, a work session sort of update for the commissioners, but I, I need to say it or I'll probably forget. Um, just one last thing about, with, with speaking of mandates, there's gonna be a lot of demand, there is a lot of demand now for support from organizations for testing, surveillance testing, because that's coming along with these mandates. The hospital, obviously, they have that too. Um, so everybody's stretched. Um, so what we would like to do, I have proposed, um, I'm, I'm actually reaching out directly to some of the, the state contractors and pay, people at the governor's office to, to put my two cents in, which is that, you know, I really feel like we need that support if there'll be, if, if it's going to be mandated, we've got people here that are having to, you know, being told they need to drive to Junction twice a week to get a test, which is obviously not ideal. And I said, this is a rural problem, <laughs> you know, and we're already at max capacity for testing. So I'm trying to get resources to help with that. Um, so I want every organization out there to know, we'll do everything we can locally to support you. We will not be able to provide that additional, you know, surveillance testing for everybody because we already are at max capacity, but I'm working on finding a solution for, for people. And since we're talking mandates, um, I think it's important to note that Rio Blanco County, the Board of Commissioners position has consistently been uh, that we are not enforcing mandates coming down from the state. And, and I would like to say, at least in my personal opinion, that the same principle applies to federal mandates as well. I'm very concerned about the fact that federal law created a HIPAA this HIPAA law, and I don't think we have the right to ask anybody if they have been vaccinated or not. And I'm just as concerned about violating that law as a presidential executive order that has not been approved by Congress. Or we'll see what the Supreme Court eventually says on that. But I, mm -hmm. I can only speak for myself no, I, at this point. But I think yeah. we want to stay right where we've been. So I would agree. I'm not. I'm that. not. Pro-vax. I'm not anti-vax. I'm not either. I'm no, no. I'm not. Yeah. I'm that's yeah. My opinion. I know. Yeah. It's I'm pro-choice, and so if if you want to get get the vaccine, get it. If you don't, don't. And so I think it's you know I've always said it's not the government's job to protect our health. It's the government's job to protect our rights. And I'll I'll just leave it at that. And you know it's kind of disheartening that that they're putting this. I mean they're going to destroy our rural health care and everything that we've 
worked so hard for, the hospitals have worked yeah. so hard for to expand, offer services to our community yeah. members, and um, so that's disheartening. But anyway, since we're talking about the repercussions of this mandate and the stress it's going to put on testing, et cetera, just for everybody's information, I think it's fair to say, Commissioner Rector is not here, but two of us out of the three, and I have a sneaking hunch, he would not differ in his opinion, but I can't speak for him. Uh, we're both sitting here saying, as far as a county, we don't feel obligated to enforce the mandates. I think, is that yep. fair to say? Yep. There's not, that's not a vote, that's not an official action, but that's just, that's what our position currently has been and will remain, I think is the way to put that. So, with that being said, can we, I know that we're at 2.30 and we're not close. It's okay, I don't have it. Actually, we are. I don't okay. have anything really specific other than I just wanted to um, get any feedback from you on 2022 goals for the department direction. I know with our work sessions, we do a lot of this, but for the sake of the Board of Health so in here. I think you've done a great job with the testing and the making the vaccines very available. And, and as far as our goals, I think at this point, just survive. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good goal. I mean, uh, we're going to have to give more the, a little thought to that. But uh, That's, that's my take on it. What are you guys? Diane, we haven't heard a lot out of you here. <laughs> well, I happen to know that the mandates that came down came with the suggestion to all the healthcare facilities in the whole country that if they don't follow this mandate, then the federal government will withhold funding for Medicare and Medicaid that is probably around 60% of most hospitals' budget. So that's why their hands are pretty well tied. But nobody is offering to pay for the weekly tests that are suggested. If you don't want to be vaccinated, then you have to submit to a weekly test. But it's going to be self-pay or take a hike one way or the other. Um, I'm challenging right now the religious exemption because I work through the hospital in Craig on the CISM sort of a counseling for critical incident stress management that we do. And I prefer not to be vaccinated. So under their mandate, then I would have to be, or they have to approve my religious exemption. So I'm supposed to go over there tomorrow. They wanted to do a Zoom meeting, but I don't like to do Zoom, so I'm going over there. So consequently, I'll find out how close they are to accepting. They, for the religious exemption, you're supposed to bring your minister. I don't have a minister for what I'm claiming. So consequently, they have to go along with me and what I believe and how I feel. So this is going to kind of test it, and I would be glad to share whatever results come back with the commissioners and everybody. So at this point, and I want to let everybody in the room know that I have this natural immunity or autoimmune because of the COVID that I experienced in July, and I was one of the hospitalized patients. And Maury didn't actually talk to me. She talked to Terry when she did the follow-up questionnaire. So consequently, I feel like I have kind of a depth of exposure to the whole event here. So I'd be, that's kind of my opinion, and I'd be glad to entertain any questions. I would be real curious what the final decision there, mm -hmm. Greg, is regarding your situation. And yeah. I wouldn't be surprised, but what the the hospitals are curious about that mm -hmm. as well. Well, they let us know that their hands are totally tied because of budget constraints, so they have to follow this mandate. But I, I like your suggestion. You know, HIPAA came from a federal, and mandate came from a presidential suggestion. And that remains to be seen whether that was constitutional mm -hmm. or not. But it sure mm -hmm. puts them in a difficult position. Um, because they're losing staff potentially over it as well. And then mm -hmm. my suspicion is they won't be able to provide the level of care that they need to. So they're damned if they do and they're damned if they don't kind of a system. Mm -hmm. but, but 
thank you for giving us your perspective and let us know. Um, thank you. So where are we at? Uh, that mostly, I, I don't want to ignore just mental health. Isn't I mean, we, there are a lot of things we still care about in public health, and so 2022 part of the goals. As long as you're okay with this, my proposed goals would be, you know, of course, continuing doing everything we can to support people through the pandemic, um, expand access to family planning services, not not expand our services, but the access to which that that's coming along. Fortunately, because of great partnerships we have with our hospitals. Um, and then continuing, of course, um, to work with the hospitals on other community health goals. Um, for anyone out there who's emailed me in the last couple of weeks, I haven't responded to you, I will respond. Um, I, I definitely won't forget about you. And then mental health, of course, that's still really important. And I know Ty's been having part of the conversation with the, the opioid settlement money. Um, and I don't, if there's anything you have for me on that, any updates, uh, you know, let me know. But right now we're still just, just kind of in organizing, figuring out who's who in the zoo. Um, once we get that figured out and it moves forward, I'll definitely be in touch and keep you posted. Yeah, we want to keep that as a focus, doing whatever we can to expand, you know, resources and, and educate people about mental health uh, in the county. That's all I have for this meeting. Hey, is there, before we um, adjourn, is there any additional thoughts anyone on the phone would like to share or in the room? First, let's go for the phone. Um, Hi, this is Liz. You know, I just I, wanted to clarify, and I could you remind me what the lady's name was that just spoke about um, her concerns in Craig? What was her name? Diane Mobley. Okay, you hear thank that, you. Mm -hmm. I did, and I just yeah. want you to. I just want you to know that with our religious waiver, we are clearly following the EEOC guidelines. Um, so we don't pick and choose what your religious rights are. I feel like that's a violation of uh, the EEOC. So right now, we are allowing people a waiver, and I'm not the judge or the jury of that. Now the CDPHE comes down in, mandates a process for us, unfortunately, we'll have to follow it. Thank you for sharing that, Liz. That helps. I know that helps me get my head wrapped around what's going on. So anyone else on the phone that has any additional thoughts to add? What about in the room? Are you good? I just want to thank everybody for yeah. putting up with me. So <laughs> thank you, Alice. I really do appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Yeah, I'd like to say thank you. And yeah. and you're in a tough tough spot, and and we recognize that. And it's you do, in my opinion, you do a great job managing and and juggling that. So keep up the good work. Thank you for your support. All right. All right. On that note, I guess uh, twelve thirty-seven or two thirty-seven. I'm sorry. We will adjourn. Thank everybody for getting on with us.